compute the Fourier coefficients for the square wave function, f of x equals minus 1 on the interval from minus pi to 0, 1 on the interval from 0 to pi. Then, state Parsifal's identity in this case. Now, to find Fourier coefficients, we're going to need a few items. First item, an inner product. So, in linear algebra, we have inner products for finite dimensional vector spaces. In multivariable calculus, we have the dot product. Here, we're going to want a notion of inner product for functions. So, we can think of functions as being a type of vector. Now, we'll define our inner product as the okay, inner product of f and g. It's going to be 1 over pi, definite integral from minus pi to pi, of f of x, gx, dx. Okay, the only problem here, this integral might not converge. Okay, for what we're doing here, we're going to be fine, though. Okay, with an inner product, we next want to find an orthonormal set. So, the orthonormal set we're going to use here is going to be given as E0 is going to be equal to 1 over square root of 2. E sub n equals cosine of nx. E sub n prime equals sine of nx. And then we're going to have n bigger than 0. So this is going to be an infinite set. Now, orthonormal, how do we get that? So first we need orthogonal. So that's just going to mean if we take any two functions in here, take their inner product, we're going to get 0. So these vectors are going to be mutually orthogonal. So all at right angles, if you were to think of a picture. Then we're going to have normalized. So that just means if we take any one of these vectors, take its inner product with itself, we get 1. So they're all unit vectors also. Now, property of an orthonormal set. If I have okay, our orthonormal set, we'll call it S, I just take a linear combination, which we call F. So that just means we're going to take a sum of numbers times elements in the set. If I want to find the coefficient ck okay, in our linear combination, all I need to do is take f inner product with e sub k, where e sub k goes with c sub k. All right, so why does this work? Well, okay, this is just going to be properties of our orthonormal set. So I'll take f against e sub k. I'll write f as a linear combination. And then I could push the inner product to the inside of the sum. Then what happens? We have inner product of EI with E sub K. If I is equal to K, then we're going to get a 1 because of the unit vector property. If I is not equal to K, we get a 0 because of the orthogonal property. So the only thing that can survive here is going to be C sub K. So that's how I get our result. Now, the idea is, OK, I have an orthonormal set. Here we're talking about functions. So you can try to stick in any function that you want in for this definition. It might make sense, it might not. It depends whether you can do this integral or not. So we take as a definition Fourier coefficients for a function f. Okay, a0 is just going to be the inner product of f with the function 1. So here we're not using our vector from the orthonormal set. Tradition says you use 1. Then for a sub n with n bigger than 0, we're just going to take f against e sub n. For b sub n, we're going to take f against e sub n prime. So that's our definition of Fourier coefficients. Let's look at our special case. So for a0, we take the inner product of f with 1. Since I have a piecewise defined function, we're going to break it up into two parts. 1 over minus 1, 1 over 1. Then we know we get pi minus pi over pi, which is 0. For a sub n, same idea, except with cosine n and x, put in each integral. Okay, Take the antiderivative, then we have terms with sine of nx. If I put pi, 0, or minus pi in there, we get 0 out. So all of our a n's are going to be equal to 0. Now. That's not a surprise. To check our work, let's just note the original function was an odd function. 1 or cosine of nx, they're going to be even functions. So an odd times an even function gives me an odd function. If you integrate an odd function over a symmetric interval, we get 0. So that checks our work. Now, b sub n will actually get something interesting. 
So we're gonna put in sine of nx into each piece. Then what comes out? We'll have cosine of nx. Note, we put in zero pi or minus pi, you're not gonna get zero. So what happens? When we simplify this, we get two minus two cosine of n pi over n. We put in n even, cosine becomes one, we get two minus two, goes to zero. If we have n odd, cosine gives me a minus one, and then this is gonna to collapse to four over n pi. So, to summarize, Fourier coefficients, if you take any a, you're gonna have zero. If you take b sub n, you're gonna get zero if n is even, four over n pi if n is odd. With the Fourier coefficients, we can now assign a Fourier series to our original function f. So, the recipe, we take a zero over two, y two, that's because we didn't use a unit vector when we defined a zero, so this is gonna be the correction. Then we take the sum over all positive integers of a sub n cosine nx plus b sub n sine of nx. In our special case, we're gonna get four over pi times the sum over all positive odd integers of sine of nx over n. Now, what's the connection from the series to the original function? In general, you'll need an analysis course to sort that out, but here what's gonna happen is our two functions, the series and the original function, are gonna be equal everywhere except at zero and plus or minus pi. So for the original function, we weren't defined at those points. For the series, we're just gonna get zero. So the series is gonna fill in the points where we're not defined. Let's take a look at some pictures to see how the series develops. Now let's take a look at Parsifal's identity. This is gonna be an analog of the Pythagorean theorem for Fourier series. By drawing a right triangle, we have hypotenuse as length L, lengths of the legs are gonna be C1 and C2. We have L squared equals C1 squared plus C2 squared by the Pythagorean theorem. Now, our function is gonna be the stand-in for the hypotenuse. What comes out is gonna be, okay, we take the inner product of F against itself, so that'll be the length squared. That's gonna be equal to, okay, we have a zero squared over two. Again, that's a correction because we're not using a unit vector. And then we'll have the sum of a sub n squareds plus the sum of the b sub n squareds. Okay, let's take a look at our special case. Now here, what do we have? First, I wanna take the length squared of our function. So when I square it, that minus one becomes a one. So it's just gonna be the integral from minus pi to pi of one, okay, then we divide by pi. So it's gonna give me a two. On the other side, we only have to sum up the b sub n's. So there we're gonna have, okay, the sum over n odd and positive of four over n pi squared. So that'll become 16 over n squared pi squared. If we push the 16 over pi squared to the other side, we're gonna get to the sum of one over n squared over the positive odd integers gives me pi squared over eight. Now. That result seems pretty unlikely, so let's just check. If I put pi squared over eight into my calculator, we get 1.2337. If I go to the computer, sum up the first 100 terms, this is gonna be one plus one third squared, all the way up to one over 199 squared. Sum it up, what do we get? We get 1.2312. So that's in the ballpark, so I believe this now. Okay, once we have this, we can get another result for free. We can get the sum as n goes from one to infinity of one over n squared equals pi squared over six. Now, before we get to that, let's take a look at a little calculation. So if I call s equal to the sum here, okay, the series we want to evaluate, what we're gonna do. If I take the sum over, okay, we'll take n even and positive over one over n squared, well, if these numbers are even, they're just gonna be equal to two times any integer that's positive. So I could rewrite this as just one to infinity of one over two n squared. Then we could factor out that two. So that's gonna come out as a one fourth. It's a perfectly legal operation to pull a scalar out of a series. So I have one fourth, okay, then we have our sum over all positive integers, and that's just gonna be one fourth times s. Now, 
Let's take a look at S itself. That's gonna be sum over all positive integers. So we can break that up into the odds and the evens. If I take the term with just the odds, that's gonna be pi squared over eight by what we just worked out. For the evens, we just saw that's gonna be 1 fourth times S. So what can we do? I can push the 1 fourth S to the other side. We have 3 fourths S equals pi squared over eight. And then if we multiply both sides by 4 thirds, we'll get pi squared over six.